Alright, this is John Cole with OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. In this episode, I'm going to go ahead and answer your guys' questions. And so I've been into a raw plant-based diet now for the last 23 years, and I've learned a lot of things along the way. So I don't know everything, <laughs> but I know what I know, and I know what has definitely worked for me. And hopefully in this episode, I'm going to share with some of those, uh, some of those things, pieces of knowledge that have helped me out so much um, you know, in the past and uh, hopefully it'll help you guys out. Now I do want to say that um, generally if you a ask questions underneath the videos and things I apologize there's a lot of subscribers that I have across all my different YouTube channels and only one of me so I don't have the time to answer each and every person as much as I would like to. I have a garden to take care of and bills to pay and just stuff like you guys out there too you know I mean I gotta eat, I gotta juice, I gotta do all this stuff. So um, if you do want to contact me I do have a way you can do that for just five dollars I will give you a call and for ten minutes I'll basically answer any questions or we could chat whatever you guys want to talk about um, that's to my Fiverr campaign it says it's for gardening but I'll answer any questions that I'm able to um, so yeah check that below and if you have a question that you want to get submitted that will fe be up be featured in an upcoming uh, Q&A episode uh, be sure to go to my YouTube channel page at OK Raw and click on the community tab once you click there there'll be a little space that says uh, you know ask your questions here <laughs> so that's where all these questions came from all right, so the first question is from uh, Kev, the vegan. What's up, Kev? All right, so, Mr. Kohler. <laughs> you could call me John. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on high-carb, low-fat uh, vegan. All right, so he didn't put in raw vegan. He just put in vegan, all right? So, first, let's define high-carb, low-fat. Because everybody you ask is going to have a different definition of high-carb, low-fat. Some people might think 80-10-10, that's high-carb, low fat and yeah that's definitely a high carb low fat but you know my, I like to have my definition uh, to be more inclusive instead of exclusive <laughs> I guess so to me a high carb diet would be consisting of at least 45 percent of your calories coming from carbohydrate rich foods and you know the other balance you know coming from protein and fat depending on what's right for you and your specific you know requirements so like no more than 35 percent fat I mean that's peaking it out at the exact top uh, but that would still be you're doing high carb because carbohydrates would dominate you know by calorie uh, your your diet um, and then you would have probably you know maybe 10 to 20 percent max protein maybe around 15 percent but that just can depend also so um, and then this is not a raw vegan high carb uh, diet. It's a vegan high carb diet. That was a, that's what he's asking for my opinions on that. So, what I'm going to say is that, you know, I think personally that high carb diets are focusing on the wrong thing. <laughs> high carb diets are focusing on the carbs, like the carbohydrates. You got to be high carbohydrate. That's the most important thing. You got to eat this ratio, and like the foods that you're eating in that ratio are not so important. You can eat breads and pastas and things, and you could be high carb absolutely but in my opinion that's very unhealthy like processed grain products um, are super unhealthy you might as well eat meat if you guys are eating breads and muffins and cookies and all these kind of things they're really not good even if they are vegan you know <laughs> so so I would say that we really need to focus our diet on a uh, high nutrient diet so you want to look into what's called a nutritarian diet this was coined by Dr. Joel Furman. You know, I've had him on my show several times, but that's a much better focus to have in your diet. And now, of course, on a nutritarian diet, you will be eating a high carbohydrate diet, but you're not eating breads and pastas and other things, hopefully at all, or it actually in any large amounts. You are actually eating whole plant foods, which in themselves are actually, for the most part, most of them, are high carbohydrates. So you will be eating a high carbohydrate diet, but you want to focus on nutrient dense or you know carbohydrates that also come with other nutrients besides just the carbs that come with you know vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients and lycopene like in my red peppers here and you know uh, different kinds of like uh, beta lanes and beets and zeaxanthin and lutein's and different leafy greens. So. Those are the kind of carbohydrates we should be focusing on and not just any old carbohydrates. And as to the macro ratios, like, you know, my opinion, you know, 
Uh, for a long time I lived on a pretty low fat, like 10, 15% fat. And I personally don't believe, you know, while that can be helpful for some people, I don't believe that low a fat percentage, especially 10% or below 10% specifically, maybe 15% might be all right, but 10% and below 10%, I personally don't believe that is optimal for optimal health. Now, of course, if you guys are healing from some kind of like major, you know, circulatory system issue, high blood pressure, yes, going on a low fat diet might be helpful for a period of time. But I think optimally, if you're healthy and all this kind of stuff, you know, having a good amount of fat, still keeping it low fat because um, low fat would be considered under 35% or I'd, I'd probably even say under 25% honestly. Um, you want to keep your fat under 25%. I like to hover around 20 to 25. Sometimes it's 15 and sometimes I'm traveling. I'm just eating a lot of fruit meals. It, it could be 10. But, you know, here's the thing. Like, fats are not bad. <laughs> Eating, you know, certain kinds of fats are bad. You know, in my opinion, oils are really not optimal foods to eat because, once again, they are low nutrient foods they don't have a lot of phytonutrients vitamins minerals and antioxidants and anti-aging or anti-disease properties contained within them because they are 100 percent fat there are a lot of calories and i don't necessarily believe the fat you eat it the fat you wear unless it's maybe oil but you know whole nuts if you're eating nuts there are studies that show when you're eating nuts you're getting the fiber you're getting all the different nutrients with the nuts you know a lot of the the fiber and stuff in the nuts actually go right through and come out the other end and actually can drag other fats with them <laughs> So we shouldn't necessarily be scared of fats, but you don't want to like overeat fats on the same token. If you eat too many fats, then you're not eating enough, you're not leaving enough space for the vegetables and, you know, other non-sweet fruits as well as sweet fruits or antioxidant rich, especially uh, sweet fruits. And then the protein, you know, I think on the macro root ratio, everybody's a little bit different. You know, I do good eating mostly fruits and vegetables. I barely eat any beans or anything else. Or, I mean, I eat some small quantities of nuts. But I believe I get enough protein for my physical requirements. Now, if you're an athlete, that may be a little bit different. But even I have friends, you know, Robert Cheek, you know, who's, who's a bodybuilder, former bodybuilder. I think he still is doing it. But he's now transitioned to a whole food, high nutrient, which is also, you know, in a high carbohydrate uh, diet. And he's getting, he's blown away his performance, even when he was like dosing up with protein powders and stuff. So, I mean, I think really it's not about like the label. Uh, a high carbohydrate because you could be like a McDougal and be high carbohydrate but then you're like you're focused on eating a lot of potatoes and rice and other things which are low nutrients so I really want you guys to strive for the nutrients whether you want to eat a vegan diet whether you want to eat a raw vegan diet whether you want to eat a paleo diet I want to encourage you guys to eat more high nutrient plant foods which in order <laughs> leafy green vegetables and herbs top of the list after that, non-sweet fruits. After that, you know, berries and other high nutrient dense fruits. And then after that, you know, other kinds of fruits, you know. And I love eating fruits. You know, one of my meals a day generally is fruits, but I generally don't like to do more than that unless I'm traveling. And uh, that is the best, or that's the best option for me. Or, you know, my other meal of fruit could be a fruit meal. And then I have a berry meal, which actually I don't count personally as fruit. So I uh, hope that answers your question further, Kev. Uh, let's see, next question is from uh, Paula Leach. What is the best method for deep cleaning the Omega NT800 even with immediate washing after juicing a buildup is developing on the auger and the pieces surrounding it? Thanks. All right, Paula. So um, let's see, deep cleaning on the NT800. So the first thing is why do you have to deep clean in the first place, right? So I recommend cleaning right after you use the juicer. And the most important thing is don't just rinse it with water. You need to use some soaps. The soaps will basically attach onto some of the phytonutrients and the pigments in the vegetables that you guys are juicing and pull those off the auger. Because if you don't use soap, you just rinse it under the water or use a brush, brush it off without soap. They're staying on there and then they're building up over time. The other thing you may want to be familiar with is actually the water in your area. I just recently bought a used a juicer on Craigslist actually. And I was like, man, this thing is like pretty gross. And basically it's all hard water deposits. So that's like really gross and then once I like did my special soak on it they basically cleaned up and the juicer looked like new so now I could sell it you know like as a, a good used juicer instead of like some old messed up juicer so there's definitely ways to deep clean it uh, but yeah keep it clean in the first place is the most important thing and once you use this technique to get it clean wash it with soap and water right after each use don't let it sit for five minutes you know don't go to work and come back and clean it later you're even asking for more troubles oh and the other thing is if you have hard, hard water, you might want to look into some kind of filtration system for your 
outside because if your hard water is depositing on your juicer if you're drinking your water it's also depositing on you so i would recommend you know that could be cause of calcification which is not a healthy thing and so i, I recommend at this point in my life uh you know a good reverse osmosis system or distillation system that will remove all the minerals i believe that we should get our minerals from the food we're eating so juice celery juice cucumbers that's a nice watery juice to get your minerals don't get your minerals from the water, then the wrong form, and they, they can build up within us. Although they can also be good for us too, but, but in my opinion, they're, you know, there's good, better, best, and <laughs> I prefer water with, without minerals or a plant-based water, such as coconut water. Um, so anyways, to deep clean your NC800, uh, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna go out and get this stuff called Cascade Dish Detergent. So it comes in like, I don't know, it used to come in that green box, and it's the powder. I don't know if they even make those anymore, because now they have all these liquid things, but Get that powdered cascade and soak that in like a, a big bucket or a big bowl with your juicer parts with hot water and a bunch of cascade and just let it sit in there overnight. That cascade is meant for dishes. It'll basically soak in and help dislodge some of the stuff. Sometimes you might have to take it out after one day, scrub it down with a brush and then actually re-soak it more to get, it more, to get some of the stuff more out. It's gonna come off uh, that way. It might take a little bit. Uh, the other thing you could try is you could use Lemmy Shine. And that's another uh, product used for, uh, you know, dishes and whatnot. I haven't tried that one myself. I, it's still on my list to do. And then I used to recommend an old method, which I no longer recommend. It was actually using OxyClean instead of either of those two that I now recommend. But I have found that the OxyClean can deteriorate the plastic parts, actually. So I no longer recommend that method, although I do have an old, old video on that method. So I uh, hope that helps you out, yeah, getting your juicer parts. And then know this, even if your juicer parts are stained, it's not really going to affect the juicer, uh, you know, functioning. It's just kind of more cosmetic. So if you're just one of those people that don't really care how your juicer looks, don't bother to deep clean it. All right. <laughs> All right. So the next question is from uh, Eric uh, Hansen. John, thanks for the great videos. Hey, I'm trying to find the best deal on goji berries in Las Vegas. Can you recommend an Asian market or other source? Thanks, Eric. All right, Eric, so the best deal on goji berries, right? So best deal, that would imply to me that you just want the cheapest price. <laughs> and so for the cheapest price, I would actually go down to Chinatown in Las Vegas. Um, let's see, um, let's see, SF Supermarket on Decatur and Spring Mountain. Or if you go down the street a little bit more, um, down Spring Mountain to uh, 99 Ranch Market, uh, they will both have the goji berries there probably for pretty doggone cheap. Um, that being said, they're just imported from China and they're probably pretty low quality. I don't know. I mean, my goji berries grow in Vegas. I mean, if you live in Vegas, I would recommend growing goji berries and letting them dry in the sun yourself. You'll, you'll have a ton. They grow really easily. Um, uh, but if you're buying cheap goji berries, you don't know the quality. They're going to be really hard. So unless you're soaking them in water so that they could be soft. And I, I don't know like how the growing practices, if they're sprayed or if they're going to be not sweet or sweet, you don't know what you're going to get. So Definitely finding cheap stuff is good. Trust me, I like a lot of cheap stuff. But more importantly for me these days, as I'm getting more mature and wise in my years, um, you know, uh, good quality, uh, you know, trumps um, cheap. <laughs> and so what I'd recommend is some other goji berries you get, get at the Naturally, uh, Natural Organic Center or Natural Healing Center. Anyways, they're on like uh, Charleston and I want to say like Buffalo around there. Natural Organic Center, yeah, so I'll post a link down below, or maybe Pure Foods Las, Las Vegas, it's a health food store. They will also have Ron Tea Gardens goji berries, and you guys could buy also Ron Tea Gardens goji berries online, these are just some local places that probably carry it. But Ron Tea Gardens goji berries are the best goji berries, aside from the ones I grow, <laughs> that I've ever found. I mean, they are from China, but he sources them specifically some specific farms that are doing certain growing practices, and they're nice and chewy instead of hard, and they are completely amazing. The only problem is they're a bit expensive. All right, so I hope that helps you out there, Eric. Uh, let's see, next question is from uh, Boris uh, Grinch Spun. John, have you ever encountered pink coconut water? Is it good for drinking? All right, Boris, yes, I've encountered pink coconut water many times. First, in young Thai coconuts that maybe are a little bit too old, I'd get pinkish or purplish coconut water. Uh, in there and I'd get it out and you know I'd put a little bit in my mouth and I'd see how it tasted. If it tasted good to me I would swallow, if it didn't taste good I would spit it out. <laughs> Basically what you're seeing is when it goes pink, purple or maybe even sometimes brown on the young coconuts um, that's basically a sign of age right. 
uh, as the coconut's in the water and it's living inside the coconut and it's aging, you know, the coconut water will basically um, create its own antioxidants because it's still a living food um, and make the water pink, right? And so that's kind of a natural chemical reaction that is occurring. Um, so um, depending on when that is occurring, if it just occurred, it's fine. But if it's been occurred and occurred for already a month and now you're drinking the water, it's probably not so good. So I've never gotten sick personally from drinking pink coconut water with a caveat. So the caveat is this. If you open a young Thai coconut, it's pink, and then you inspect the nut inside and there's no cracks, then it's probably all right to drink, and I would probably drink it if it didn't taste foul or nasty to me. Now, if I open up the coconut water, I pour it out, and then I look inside the coconut and there's cracks, that means air has stepped in, bacteria could seep in, and then I would not drink it. If there is no cracks, then it's basically just natural fermentation or, you know, um, antioxidants that's occurring in the coconut that's a sealed vessel so it's like still sterile it's just kind of getting funky <laughs> getting kind of funky <laughs> uh, okay so that's talking about the whole young Thai coconuts um, and then the next thing is um, in HPP bottled coconut waters they will turn pink because when they take the coconut the Thai coconut water out of the coconut which is a better way to drink them put it in a bottle and then they put the bottle under pressure the pressure that is they are exerting on the coconut causes it to react and create antioxidants so it turns pink or purplish color. And that's fine, right? And as long as it doesn't take taste like bad to you, it's probably all right to drink. And even though they have expiration dates on the HPP bottled coconut waters, I've drinking them a month, maybe even sometimes two months past the date, uh, kept at cold temperatures, of course, and I'm fine and I had no adverse reactions, although I don't necessarily recommend doing that. The freshest is always bestest. Have a coconut palm planted outside your door and harvest them fresh and eat them right then and there. Um, you know, it would always be my preference. All right, so hope that answers your question there. Uh, next question is from uh, Teddy Brown. What's up, Teddy? <laughs> uh, how can fruitarians have a balanced diet when they, when they only eat fruit? That's a good question. So um, I personally don't follow a pure fruitarian diet where I only eat fruit. And I personally don't recommend that anybody do that. Now, if you're already doing that and you're having great results and you're feeling good and you got blood tests and they're all looking good, do whatever you guys want to do. I'm saying that if it was me, I would not do a pure fruitarian diet with no like leafy greens, which actually are right here on the side of the camera. Because behind me I have all fruiting crops, melons and peppers. Oh, I actually have leafy greens right below me if you guys could see that. Probably can't. It's purslane, so I have lots of purslane. But I believe, you know, to be a balanced diet, you need to eat more than just fruit, you know. I've only ever met like one person that eats 99% of his diet of fruit and because he really doesn't like vegetables, that has been really successful, that I would call successful and healthy on a uh, pure fruitarian diet. And he actually, he lives on his own land and grows probably 199.9% .9 of his own fruit that he eats in rock dust and he has such a wide variety of fruits and to get all the different minerals and, and vitamins in there. And, and I, I mean, although he's doing great, you know, I believe he could probably be healthier by doing more vegetables and leafy greens. Um, and he lives in a really clean environment where there's like very little pollution and all this kind of stuff. So I believe it is possible, but I believe you're making your life a lot harder. And if you're trying to be a pure fruitarian and live off the grocery store fruit, like I would say that's really bad. It's probably gonna mess up your teeth. You know, I did used to eat a lot more fruit, um, you know, when I was younger. And definitely, I see now how it would have benefited me a lot more by eating a lot more vegetables. And even if you're eating, if you, especially sweet fruit, like you need to eat more non-sweet fruits. If you're going to try to do a pure fruitarian diet, eat more non-sweet fruits. Super critical, super important, you know, like cucumbers, um, uh, peppers, you know, because too much sugar, I mean, if you're younger and you're burning it, that's great, you can handle it, but as, you're, as you get older, as I've learned, you know, maybe your body doesn't handle it as good as it used to, and your body's really needing some of the, that, those alkaline minerals, but also some of the phytonutrients in the leafy greens that are not found in fruits, you know, like kale and, and garlic and onion family of plants all have anti-cancer properties, and yeah, of course, there's different anti-cancer properties in fruit, but why limit yourself to just the anti-cancer properties in fruit when you could get the best of both worlds? And I encourage you guys not to live by any dogma, whether it's a fruitarian dogma, whether it's a raw food dogma, any kind of dogma. 
vegan dogma, you know, try to get yourself out of that box because they do confine you and they can limit you in my opinion. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's all I'll say to that today. Uh, next question is from a uh, Rita Richardson. Yes. Thank you. My question is, do you have a recipe for dog food? I saw in one of your videos where you fed your little dog healthy foods. I would love it. All right, Rita. So I don't think I ever came out with a video on healthy dog food. Um, you know, like I know some people might get mad at me for saying this and some people won't, but basically, I mean, dogs are scavengers. I mean, they're not true carnivores because they're not going to eat a diet of solely meat. And come on, my 11 pound or 10 pound <laughs> min miniature pincher with his small jaw is not going to take down like a, a chicken or something, man. The chicken's probably going to mess him up. So he's really not going to be eating and killing his own meat. Maybe cats, on the other hand, they could kill meat, eat them, and that's great. And you know, um, but here's the thing. This is my take on it. My take on pets and animals is that you got to get off feeding them the kibble. That's the worst stuff. It's like us eating processed food 100% of the time. If you guys are watching this channel, watching this video, you guys know that I advocate a plant-based whole food diet consisting of fruits and vegetables, you know, nuts and grains and seeds to whatever, to the extent that you need. Um, but our diet should be dominated in fruits and vegetables, in my opinion. And that's the healthiest way for us to live. But it's also the healthiest for our four-legged friends. They need to eat also these high nutrient foods so they could not get cancer. We could keep them healthy. Um, you know, and not eat the processed foods. You know, feeding dog kibble to your dog is like you eating Triscuits or like these insured diet drinks that have all your vitamins in there because they're highly processed. And unfortunately, a lot of dog foods are just the reject human foods that are really low quality. So if you guys, I plead with you guys, if you guys are still feeding kibble, don't do it. Yes, even the vegan kibble. I'm against vegan kibble. John, you're not a vegan, you're against vegan kibble. Yes, I'm against vegan kibble because it's a highly processed food product. Feed your dog carrots, feed them broccoli, feed them celery, you know, blend it up in the blender because they have teeth and some dogs have teeth problems like a dog I was visiting with this last weekend. You know, he would love to eat broccoli but and he would love, he loves carrots but he couldn't eat the carrots because he was missing like 10 teeth. So he'd chew the carrot, he couldn't chew it and then he'd spit it out and it's like, oh, the carrot is so anti-cancer and so nutritious for the dogs. Most dogs love carrots and if they have their teeth, they could eat them. But if your dog doesn't have teeth, getting elderly, blend up the carrots in a vacuum blender, you know, or, or juice carrots for your pets, give them your juice, give them your green smoothies, share the food that you eat that's high nutrient with them, right? And I also do, while I do feed my dog foods that I eat, you know, certain things he likes, certain things he doesn't like, he, he likes mangoes, he likes jackfruit, he likes every salad I make, whether it's a salad or whether it's a blended salad or whether it's a soup, he always loves it. I add things like seaweed and mushrooms and all kinds of cool stuff in there. And, you know, and, and he just loves to eat that. So he's getting high nutrient foods too. So it'll protect his life so that he'll leave a healthier life as well. And, you know, I don't just feed my dog vegan either. For the, those of you guys that say, meat, dogs are carnivores. Well, actually, dogs are omnivores. Um, they are set up anatomically, uh, anatomically uh, you know, to be eating meat more effectively. But they could also digest vegetables because, I mean, you'll see your dog eating grass, right? So I also feed my dog a freeze-dried, so this is a raw um, uh, animal uh, dog food. So it's freeze dried whole, um, basically meats with vegetables. So it's like, I wish I could find one that's like mostly vegetables with meats. This just makes it convenient for me because I don't want to have to buy meat, touch it, deal with it. Um, you know, so I have a freeze dried food that you just add water to and then you basically uh, feed it to him. But that's, that's, in, that's in addition and in small quantities because the most of my diet that I would want for my dog is coming from the food I'm eating and real food that he actually he loves so much. I think he loves it more than his dog food. And the other thing that's really important, I believe, for pets as well as us is diet rotation. You'll feed your dog the same dog kibble each and every time, and there's only a limited amount of nutrients. So he's missing on a lot of different phytonutrients. So if he's eating what you're eating, hopefully you're eating a lot of different things. And then you always have that fill-in freeze-dried dog food for your dog. And sometimes I get the turkey, sometimes I get the chicken, sometimes this, sometimes that, um, you know. But also, always, those foods aren't just 100% meat. They're also containing a lots of vegetables. So this way, he gets his meat, but he gets a lot more vegetables. And I think that's definitely what I believe, personally. And, you know, people are going to argue with me on this point. But this is my opinion. And if you guys have different opinions, I encourage you guys to make your own videos and show what you do for your dogs to educate others. All right? So thank you. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to go for that. Oh, and then when I was cooking for my dog, so I did get a pressure cooker so I could cook for my dog, I was making them, like, basically... It was like I was feeding them cooked lentils and brown rice in the pressure cooker um, for a while. But, 
you know, you could maybe do that and then like add in meat and other vegetables in there. Um, but I think for me now, it's easier just to feed them what I'm feeding them because I'm that's what I'm eating, and then use that um, you know freeze dried dog food. It is kind of expensive, but it's but I think it's worth it. Um, you know, in smaller quantities just to fill in. So he's make, making sure we're getting some of, some of the other nutrients that the dog might need. That I mean, not, he might not get from my vegan plant based uh, raw diet actually. All right, next question from uh, Will and Tammy Orr. John, thanks for all you do. Do you ever juice beets? If so, what are some of the benefits? And what are some of the niggas doing so? Thank you, sir. Yes, I do juice beets. And so there are definitely pros and cons to every food on the planet. <laughs> and let's see, beets contain betalanes, which there are so much research on betalanes. I don't know if I remember any, off, any of it off the top of my head, but they are very important antioxidants for anti-aging, I would say that, and also disease prevention. And especially there's a lot of research in beets um, with juicing beets can help with you know things like uh, blood pressure increasing oxygen circulation in your blood so like people in the in the Olympics and whatnot they will drink straight beet juice and their performance will improve maybe by like a quarter or a tenth of a second but that's an improvement because now they could their, their oxygen carrying capacity is much better so beets could be quite healing uh, you know for your uh, heart and circulatory system and all that kind of stuff you know I like it because of its antioxidant effects it keeps you younger and you know there's so much research that have been done and also have yet to be done so we don't really know even everything beets can do <laughs> so um so one of the negatives about beets is that one of the first times i'm like oh beet juice it's so good i juiced a bunch of straight beets and had like a cup of beet juice maybe like eight ounces i drank it straight and i remember driving around in my car and then like a little bit later i remember just like feeling nauseous so that i pulled over my car opened the door and leaned out the side and i threw up all the beet juice i'm like Whoa, beet juice is really powerful. Don't juice straight beets. So for a long time, I never juiced straight beets, but that was also right when I was getting into it. So I was probably quite toxic and had a lot of detox to do. Nowadays, I don't necessarily juice straight beets, but I do do a pretty strong beet juice with like four beets with carrots and like maybe a few apples and other roots and ginger and turmeric in there. And I do a lot of beets and I'm totally fine. I feel good about it. And yeah, so I would say, um, uh, and the other thing is you can juice your beet greens. So don't forget about the beet greens. Actually, I grow beets in my garden, not for the beet roots, but for the greens, I produce a lot more greens than the beets themselves. And they have similar nutrients as the beets and maybe even a little bit more. So I want to encourage you guys to use your beet greens if they look good if you're buying them from the store. Because a lot of times you'll buy beets from the store and the greens are looking pretty sad. In that case, if you do cook your foods, I would actually cook them or saute them up. Um, steam them actually would be the best way. Um, and eat your beet greens because they are quite nutritious. All right. So hope that answers your question there. Next question from uh, Jess Eats Fruit. So wow, she has a bunch of questions. Dang, I have a lot of questions. Uh, I guess I'll just answer one at a time. Do you have a good method for quick washing a lot of celery? It's always the base of my green juice, but I find they get slimy sometimes or have lots of dead bugs in them. So I have to be pretty thorough washing them before making juice and it takes so long. All right, so number one thing is when you buy them, inspect them. This will save you guys the most time so that you don't have to clean them. <laughs> so, I mean, I recently got a good deal on like a four pack of organic celery hearts for a dollar. And so like I didn't go through and inspect every one to get the cleanest ones. But if I was, because it was like so cheap and I'll just, you know, spend a little bit of time washing them. But if I was buying them and paying full price, I would like pick up each head and I would go through the whole display at the store or at the farmer's market and find all the celery and probably touch every one. So people probably wouldn't like me for that. And then I'd check and weigh each one. So I'd get the heaviest one. So I'd set all the heaviest ones aside because I want to buy the biggest ones when they're sold by the each, because that means more juice. Then I'd take the biggest ones and I'd find the biggest ones. And then I'd go through and look at each of the biggest ones, kind of trying to look and pull back some of the celery to like kind of look down in there to see if it's like really dirty and if there's a lot of bugs. So, and then I try to pick the cleanest ones of the biggest ones to buy. And then those are the ones that actually I end up buying. Um, and then that way, cleaning is a lot less. Now, when I clean my celery, basically I turn the water on high on the sprayer on my, on my sink. And then I take the celery stock and put it with the head side up, not the cut side, but the head side up. And I basically pull back the celery like I'm revealing or opening something up. And I spray the water down in there at the same time I have a, a vegetable brush that I'm brushing out the sides. And usually if I open up each little segment and I could spray down in there, it sprays any kind of uh, loose dirt uh, free. And then I'm, I'm pretty good. And then I uh, will let that hang upside down and dry and drip dry for a little bit until I've washed them all. 
and then I'll take those out. I'll cut off the top and cut off the bottom, and then I'll basically open them up, and if there's any leftover dirt that didn't get dislodged from washing, I'll take a paper towel and I'll just kind of brush it off, and then I'll sit there and chop my celery up before dropping it into my juicer. So I don't know if that'll save you time, but that's my technique I use. Yeah, I guess the first thing is like buy celery that's not slimy. <laughs> and the other thing is don't buy too much celery so have it sitting in your fridge and going slimy on you. Only, you know, buy as much as you need for the next few days and try to shop more often if you are able to, right? I mean, it'd be best to shop every day. I mean, I like to shop in my garden every day when I'm going to make dinner. I don't like harvest all my peppers and then har take them from the fridge. I come out and harvest a few peppers as I need them like I did last night. You know, I harvest a bunch of peppers for my uh, pepper tomato uh, dressing for my pizzas that I also harvested my basil fresh to chop up and my onions fresh on top All right, so let's see. Let's see next question is from a uh, Seven months pregnant and two hours of juicing from prep to cleanup is not my cup of tea. I also I also second hearing your thoughts on high fat raw vegan diets All right, so yeah, I guess your next question is a uh, high fat raw vegan diet so I talked about low fat raw vegan diets earlier now, high fat raw vegan diets, I mean like, I think each person needs to find the amount of fat for them, right? And I think what's more important than high fat or low fat is the type of fats, right? Oils, in my opinion, except if it's like a DHA oil um, in small quantities, which is what I take, oils are probably not a good source of fat, in my opinion, because they are low nutrient fats. Um, high fat raw food diet, I mean, number one, I wouldn't go above 35% calories from fat because then you're just not having enough space for other phytonutrients from leafy greens, vegetables, and fruits, right? That being said, you know, some people may do better with a high percentage fat. You know, me, I like to keep the fat around, you know, 15, 20%. Um, I feel the best at that because, you know, I feel that if I eat too many fats, they make me feel sluggish. Now, different people digest differently and different people need different things. And I would say if you are going to do a high fat diet and you feel good on that, um, just notice how you feel, but make sure, make sure, make sure you're not eating too many fats because fats are super easy to overeat. They taste amazing. I mean, I have friends still that just chomp on like a pound of nuts and they'll eat a pound of nuts and they're gone. But then that pound of nuts is so many calories when you could be drinking a vegetable juice and so many, you could be eating so many other things in the place of the calories you ate because of the nuts. Um, you know, I know Gabriel Cousins on high fat, you know, uh, raw vegan diet and he has reasons for that and maybe in some certain situations where you're trying to heal from certain illnesses that might be good to do for a while but I mean my personal belief is that in the long run um, it's not so good but once again each person needs to find their perfect balance that feels right for them so that's my opinions all right next question is from a K Kavya Pralad <laughs> I recently saw a video which said that Above the ground veggies, especially greens, have anti-nutrients that can be harmful if juiced. The video says that plants want to survive from being eaten by animals, so they have some toxins like goitrogens, oxalates, polyphenols, tannins, lectins, etc. to make them less appetizing. And so we shouldn't juice more than a couple handfuls of green, especially kale, spinach, etc. Now this makes logical sense to me, but I never seen anyone talk about it or advise against juicing greens. Your opinions, please. All right, so I do a video where I talk about oxalates and juicing and blending. And so number one, yes, greens have anti-nutrients in them. I don't know that they're any more harmful if juiced or whether they're eaten raw or even cooked because even cooking will not denature some of the anti-nutrients in greens. Does that mean because greens have anti-nutrients, we should eat something else? Well, everything has anti-nutrients and meat has more, and dairy has more anti-nutrients in my opinion <laughs> than beneficial nutrients, all right? So I always encourage you guys to do good, better, best. If you're gonna make a choice between like, you know, uh, meat or eggs and dairy and a salad, go for the salad. <laughs> Even despite its <laughs> anti-nutrients, in my opinion, it's still way healthier because it has a lot more phytonutrients, beneficial vitamins and minerals, and anti-cancer um, you know, properties, like especially in things like kale. And also, although they are called anti-nutrients in high doses, they definitely can be anti-nutrients, but in small doses, they can be beneficial nutrients. There are some studies that show like some of the things like, what is it? like uh, lectins, like lectins, oh don't eat lectins, they're bad. 
Lectins in small amounts can be beneficial for us. It may even kill cancer and all these kind of crazy things. So, you know, we don't want too much of anything and we don't want too little of anything. And what is the balance? John, how many greens should I eat? Well, I'll tell you, my goal every day is to eat two pounds of greens. And that being said, although I try to eat two pounds of greens every day, I might get in one pound of greens every day. Um, just depends on the day, what greens I have available, all this kind of stuff. I mean, if I'm not traveling, then I'm usually juicing a pound of greens and maybe eating a pound of greens for salad at dinner time. Um, but the other thing to remember is I don't eat the same greens each and every day. I don't have one pound of kale every day for the last two years. I would get so bored. I mean, kale is great, but eating it every day is not great in my opinion because now you're getting too much of the anti-nutrients in kale and you're not getting nutrients from other leafy greens. So, I mean, I have a multitude of leafy greens in my diet or in my garden right now. I mean, I have uh, beet greens in front of me. I have aptinia greens in front of me. I have wild lettuce greens here. I have uh, Riccardi's picroides in front of me over there. I have, uh, I think I said purslane. I have um, water spinach over there. I have malbar spinach over there. I have shiso over there. I have water pepper over there. And I probably got, oh, collard, tree collards right here. I mean, I could just keep going on and then I have some romaine hearts in the fridge because they're not doing so good at 100 degree weather outside right now. And I have, you know, dinosaur kale growing. Um, you know, I have, uh, yeah, so I have oh, longevity spinach in the back. I have all different greens and I'm, I'm, I'm picking a, a few of each one every day or I'm picking this one this day and I pick a different one the next day and I pick a different one the next day because every food has different, you know, nutrients and anti-nutrients. So I want to get all the nutrients from foods with minimal amounts of anti-nutrients. Um, you know, it is true when you do juice them, things can be concentrated, right? Because you are removing the fiber. That being said, inherently juicing greens, in my opinion, does not necessarily make them unhealthy. In my opinion, they actually make them healthier because especially if you're juicing them, you're removing the nutrients from the fiber. And if you're, if you're just eating a kale whole, and especially if you don't chew well, you're not gonna get the nutrients out of it anyways. And it's basically just gonna go through you as roughage. And you're gonna see salad greens coming out you at the other end, like I've seen many times from people after I go to the bathroom and they didn't flush. <laughs> so um, I want you guys to get the benefits from your greens. So what that means, uh, chew them really well, where that means vacuum blending them, which is what I recommend now, not regular blending like in a Vitamix, or juicing them, I think that can be beneficial, and everything in moderation. We don't wanna have a green-based diet where we're only eating greens and the, that's the only thing we eat because they are the best in, in nutrient density, no. We wanna eat other foods as well and, have, and be balanced, you know? So I eat a lot of greens, leafy greens, but I also eat plenty of other vegetables, uh, fruits, uh, berries, and uh, you know nuts and seeds and even some beans to a much smaller extent in my personal diet. And that's a good good segue here. If you guys are looking for a good book that has healthy raw food recipes, because I know there's a lot of raw food recipe books out there. You know, a lot of them contain oil, uh, salt, and excess, and they're just. I mean, the food may taste good, but the food's not really that healthy for you, in my opinion. I finally, after 23 years being raw, uh, with the help of a friend came out with my recipe book that also has my teachings about eating and being healthy uh, that could save you guys a lots of headaches and trouble because I've gone through literally the trenches to find out what works and what doesn't work. And now in my recipe book, I have high nutrient dense, plant-based raw meals uh, predominantly in there because it's actually food that I actually eat <laughs> on a daily basis. Although every day, although I wrote down those recipes, every day I make something based on what's in my what's in my garden and you know things I grab because I don't really ever measure anything when I make stuff I just start throwing stuff in and it tastes good because I kind of know what I'm doing but anyways if you guys don't know what you're doing check the link down below gygbook.com uh, pick up my growing your greens recipe book while it is still available and uh, you know you're gonna have over 130 recipes in that recipe book so you guys can start eating healthier and more importantly learn some of the some of the uh, things I do in my life to stay healthy all right next question is from blank blank <laughs> Is it safe to plant root vegetables next to the house? Wondering if they would go under my house and cause problems, thanks. All right, so root vegetables such as beets and carrots, um, these things are not invasive plants. They will not go underneath your house. Um, sunchokes, I mean, I don't even think sunchokes. I mean, the sunchokes won't really go underneath your house and if they do, they're not gonna push up your foundation. Now, fruit trees and other trees can definitely be a big no-no near your house. So be really cautious with fruit trees and even fruit shrubs and things and, and non-fruiting trees. 
but I would have no problem planting vegetables or root vegetables you know next to my house that are annuals because annuals generally only live one year anyways or you know during a season um, now perennial vegetables even perennial vegetables I wouldn't really have a problem planting right next to my house either um, because they're like roots aren't tap roots and they don't go really long and they don't really seek out water or anything like that right so they're totally safe in my opinion all right and then last question for today is uh, realms and dimensions of existence hey John one of the biggest things I've been struggling with are cravings what do you suggest for someone who is transitioning but is facing a hard time with cravings? Wow, that's a hard question. So I can tell you how I dealt with it when I had cravings back in the day. I, I, I have no cravings anymore because all those flavor sensations have left the building. They're out of my body. Like I don't really crave things that I had because it, it, I, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really remember actually at this point like what a Snickers bar, I mean I kind of could kind of imagine what a Snickers bar would taste like but I don't really crave those things. I don't crave hamburgers. I don't crave hot dogs or cheeseburgers or french fries or potato chips anymore because I, I just don't really I don't know if I'd even like the taste anymore. I'm sure it would taste good, but the problem is I would feel bad after I ate it. So there's, there's many ways to deal with cravings. So for me, when I dealt with cravings, it was like life or death, basically. So like I'm like, John, if you eat raw vegan foods and he healthy foods, you could live. And if you eat you know the unhealthy foods you're not gonna live so like I'm like my belief was that if I took one bite I would not be healthy and I might get sick again end up in the hospital and that's why I got onto this diet in the first place because most lost my life when I was younger so I had a really big motivation to stay on track was I 100% perfect no was I like 98 99 percent perfect yes <laughs> you know and if I did slip up on my cravings I'd have like McDougal vegan burrito which is like no oil or I'd have like vegan like baked potatoes I made at home <laughs> you know no butter um, and, but then even those foods after being on a raw high nutrient diet you know I felt terrible it didn't make me feel good so then I just like you know what these foods are not good and I just didn't feel good eating them so I just didn't really do it so so I tried to go through with sheer willpower and like willpower could you could use to some extent but sometimes you you'll you'll your willpower will be overpowered by the cravings you're having so I would say, number one, I would say try to distract yourself. When you're having cravings, have a certain food that is your comfort food, that's a healthy food to eat instead. Okay, so that's number one. Like, I don't know, maybe you might eat dates and almond butter. Those aren't the healthiest raw foods, but they're probably healthier than eating potato chips, french fries, or a hamburger, right? And those might satisfy your cravings so that you're like, oh, I got some sugar and I got some fat, some nuts in me. And if you want a treat, you want to do baru nuts with dates. <laughs> I like to eat those sometimes. Um, but those are quite good. So, or find something else. Find some kale chips. If you have a craving for, you know, um, some potato chips that are fried, right? Get some kale chips. They're not the super healthiest stuff in the world, but they're definitely a bigger step in a better direction. So try to find a substitution for the, for the bad craving that will meet your craving, but is a healthier version. So that's number one. Uh, number two is... Maybe you're just having craving because you're lacking an emotional need. Now, I haven't really delved into this emotional stuff, and I'm not the one to answer emotional eating questions at all. But I would say one of the easiest things to do is distract yourself. Do something else. Go out for a run. Go for a jog. Um, I don't know. Get together with your lover. <laughs> I don't know. Go do gardening. Lie out in the sun. Go on a vacation. Do something else. Then think of food because many times you're having cravings. It's not necessarily a, a hunger need but it's maybe an emotional need that's not being met. So try to fill that need by doing something else in life. Whatever it is <laughs> that makes you happy, turns you on, whatever, right? right? So I'll just end there. <laughs> One of the things that I did for craving specifically was when I'm craving something, then I would try to eat something especially high nutrient, you know? So especially when I'm craving something salty or something like that, I would go for something like some seaweed, like dulse. Dulse is like my favorite seaweed. So I'd, if I'm craving something salty, then maybe my body's telling me that I really need minerals if it's not an emotional need or not some other crazy need, right? So I'd eat some dulse and maybe eat some dulse with avocado, like whole leaf dulse, not, the, not like the little shreds, but whole leaf dulse, like wrap the dulse around the avocado and eat it, make sure there's no uh, dried snail shells in the dulse, the whole leaf dulse first, and, um, and eat it, you know, and that might solve your craving. So I wanna try to encourage you guys to find something that's gonna meet your craving that's not super junky. And if all else fails, 
you know, and this is last resort, you know, and you're really, you've tried the other things and it's just not working, I gotta, I gotta do my craving, John, then eat very small portions of your craving and allow yourself just like one bite. But then after that one bite, then eat something healthy so that you're meeting your craving, you got one bite of stuff, but then you're eating a big salad, you're drinking a fresh juice, you're making a fresh smoothie. So now you had your craving fulfilled, that taste sensation you wanted, but now you're eating something healthy right on top of it. And of course, also uh, take some enzymes. So I mean, I guess that's all the, the tips I would have for you guys on cravings. I mean, I, I just powered through my cravings. Um, but yeah, hopefully those tips work. Substitution principle, distraction, um, you know, I think are uh, su were super important for me personally. Or finding something that's uh, healthier than what you're craving uh, would be. Or, you know, just give in to them, but then eat something healthy and eat small quantities of whatever that thing is you're craving to uh, just meet that emotional more than likely uh, need because probably what you're craving is not nutrient dense. All right, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. If you guys like this Q&A, hey, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. That'll encourage me to do more Q&As in the future. If you want, you could try to leave questions below and maybe I'll try to answer one or two of them. Um, also, be sure to share this video with somebody else you might think it can help and be sure to uh, check my past episodes. My past episodes are a wealth of knowledge over 500 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to teach you guys how to eat more fruits and vegetables in your life so that you guys can get healthier. And be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss out on any of my new and upcoming episodes I've coming out of every five to seven days. You never know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. So uh, with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.